All right, everyone. Here we go. Buster. I was talking with the Orioles manager, Buck Showalter, this summer, and he asked me, he said, you know, what stories have you been working on? I said, I'm doing something on Ben Petrick, and he just goes, wow. Ben Petrick. What happened to Ben Petrick? He was a comet that went across baseball's skyline for about three, four years. Maybe the best comparison that you could make would be to Buster Posey. He was a high draft pick, but he was considered to be a super athlete for a catcher. He was someone who could play multiple positions, was very fast. People who saw him at that time, they thought, you know what, he could have been a Hall of Famer, but because of circumstances out of his control, within four years from the start of his career, he was retired. Go to contact. This is Ben Petrick. Eight years ago, his major league career ended. Now 35, he's home coaching high school baseball. I only wish for two things in life. To be a father and to be a pro ball player. He was as gifted as any catcher that had come up. His Thurman Munson, his Johnny Bench. He had all the talents that you could possibly want. Hammer to left field. Wow, Ben Petrick. Catchers that can run, that can throw, uh, hit for power and average. I mean, you don't see guys like that. But at 23, Ben Petrick realized his life wouldn't turn out the way he imagined. I was catching Jamie Navarro. He's only like a 94 mile fastball. up. My reach up to catch the ball, and uh, just did my my hand my hand to get there in time wasn't fast enough, and I barely took took the ball and went to the backstop, and I was like, "That's not that's not me. I, that's not right." When I packed up and left my hometown of Hillsborough, Oregon, I was the object of everyone's envy. When I returned, I was the object of everyone's pity. As a young boy growing up just outside of Portland, Oregon, Ben played sports for his father, Vern, a longtime high school athletic director. When he was five years old, he was playing in a baseball game. Light and drive, shot right up the middle, boom. Ben's glove went up, he caught it, and it wasn't accidental. Ben was so excited one day, he leaped up over the car seat, and we're just about ready to go, and he says, Mom, I know, I know what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a Major League Baseball player. With his father as AD, Ben started running back on Glencoe High's 1994 state championship team. And he thrived in baseball, hitting 514 as a senior to earn State Player of the Year honors. That spring, in 1995, the Colorado Rockies drafted Ben in the second round. Oh, my God. Yeah! Those early days of his career were just filled with um, enthusiasm and hope. Over the next four years, Ben climbed slowly but steadily through the Rockies system. Now, tell me about the phone call you get when he's uh, promoted to the big leagues for the first time. Are you kidding me? That was the greatest feeling in the world. Hey, that's his first career home run. Ben Petrick. A September 1999 call up, Ben hit 323 and 62 at bats with four homers and 12 RBI. I remember the game being really easy. When the season was over, I had the visions of grandeur. He was a special breed. He was our catcher of the future. Our expectations were, we're an all-star catcher. He's young, his ceiling's his limit. Well, his ceiling came crashing down. I sat down on my computer, and I was mistyping. I'm like, what's, what's going on? So I kind of... I looked at my hands and I'm like, I tried to, I tried to, I did this. And my left hand was like this. I was like, that's really weird. Why isn't it, why isn't it going fast? For the next six months, 
then experienced slight tremors, rigidity, and slowness of movement on his left side. In May of 2000, a specialist told him he had the symptoms of early onset Parkinson's disease. Ben was 23. To develop Parkinson's disease in your 20s is distinctly rare, well less than 1%. I was, I was in complete shock, total disbelief. I have this tough decision to make. Well, I mean, am I going to quit now, or am I going to just try to just keep going? In an instant, the body that had been my greatest asset became my greatest liability. So for as long as he could, Ben took medication and played with an incurable disease. From 2000 to 2003, as a catcher and outfielder for the Rockies and Tigers, he hit 250 with 23 homers in 221 games, showing flashes of both his talent and his unrealized potential. All the while, he kept the secret of his relentlessly advancing illness from everyone except his family, a few teammates, and his then coach, Clint Hurdle. You know, I can just always remember focusing in on the glove when he'd set up defensively see if the if the glove would, the target would shake i'd be behind the plate and i was actually having like anxiety over whether i could catch it that's when i started realizing that this is getting worse i like, starting to affect my skills and mentally it was affecting me thinking about trying to cover it up i felt bad at times i felt like my my hurting the team because i'm kind of being selfish but i don't know i just didn't want to let go of my dream When he hit that home run off of Randy Johnson, he can't swing his left arm when he's running around the bases. I mean, it's just completely rigid. It's not just flowing in rhythm. It's like, wow, there's a guy that has Parkinson's disease, you know, that just went yard off of arguably one of the best pitchers in the game. The game itself is hard enough. You know, to have a, a disease like that that actually f affects your motor skills and be successful while you're hiding the secret, it's actually pretty amazing. I'd be in the outfield, you know, Joe Schmill is up to bat, and I'm reaching out of pocket in between pitches, taking, taking pills so I can function. That's how I was in my career. Watch the clock, play the game, take the meds. By the spring of 2004, Ben knew his dream was over. Parkinson's forced him to retire from the game he loved. He was 27 years old. Stripped of his identity and the only job he ever wanted, he returned home to face the rest of his life. He's very self-conscious. It destroyed him. Because he was pretty caught up in being somebody that um, special in just a handful of years i'd gone from somebody to a sideshow a one-time physical specimen who now needed his wife's help tying his shoes when we were talking about getting married i kind of just said listen you don't know who you're going to fall in love with and i'm in love with you and i'm going to accept everything that comes with it the road's been a lot harder than we ever imagined it's better. Palm down. Staying connected to the game, Ben gave private hitting lessons. Nice. But often he would retreat to his home, ashamed of his progressing illness. By 2007, he moved to the same tree lined street where he grew up, just a short distance from the man who shared his dreams and his disease. Ben's father was diagnosed with Parkinson's seven months before his son. How's it impacted your relationship with him? It's gotten us closer, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's tough to see myself as different as I am. So at times, it's tough to see my dad struggle to do things. My dads are invincible, you know? I think he was 
as I was at a loss for what is this going to do for me or do to me? How much am I going to have to endure? Get the hot tub all. Can you fill it with water? Doctors have been unable to detect a genetic link between Ben and his father's Parkinson's disease. I only wish for two things in life to be a pro ball player and to be a father. Parkinson's took one of those. I wasn't going to let it have both. On September 24, 2007, Ben's daughter McKenna was born. By then, his condition was much worse than his father's. During the necessary periods of the day he was off medication, Ben's body became frozen like a statue. When he was on medication, he would display involuntary movements. As his wife returned to work as a teacher, Ben faced a daunting reality. When my medication wasn't working, I had no chance taking care of the baby. No chance. I wouldn't be able to walk to her very fast if, if something happened. If she was choking, I wouldn't be able to, you know, like help her. I, I, I mean, it's, it's scary. In 2009, in an effort to improve his quality of life, Ben decided to undergo an aggressive and high-risk surgery. He said, look, I'm not really worth much to my family right now. If I live, it's going to make you know, me a better father, a better husband. If I die, they're going to collect some life insurance, and they're going to be better off, and they can get on with their lives. Days before the surgery, Ben prepared a video message for his two-year-old daughter, McKenna. Hi, McKenna. It's your dad. I just wanted to make sure I took the opportunity before I leave this, this earth that, uh, that I express to you how much I love you, how much you've meant to my life. And I've just been so grateful to be able to be your dad. On December 18, 2009, Ben underwent a surgical procedure called DBS, Deep Brain Stimulation. During the six-hour operation, electrodes were placed into Ben's brain and attached to a device implanted in his chest that sends electrical impulses to block the tremors and rigidity caused by his Parkinson's. In the surgery, they gave me a little flash. They're like, wiggle, wiggle your hands. I was like, wow, that's awesome. I started laughing and I was in the hour laughing. For a few moments that day, Ben felt like his old self, Oh, big Elmo. He went home for Christmas. But nine days after the surgery, he suffered severe seizures and was rushed to the hospital. Ben had that most feared uh, complication. The infection was along the electrodes implanted in the brain, so everything had to come out. Girl, I was ready. I, I had told myself that uh, Ben probably wasn't going to make it. Ben was lower than low and basically just came clean with his dad. I heard him say, it may be easier if I just died. Then you wouldn't have to deal with this. I said, Ben, there's a little girl at home that depends on you. Don't you ever give in. You owe it to your little girl. Don't ever give in. Didn't you just tell me you gotta, you gotta suck it up? Oh, and he was, he's right. I mean, I, I job it was, it was more important than me, but I, I was so self-consumed in, in what I was going through. So he, he was just being a good dad once again, challenging me, giving me on the right path. And, and that's, what I, that's what I focused on, was, was getting back to my, my job is a dad and husband, you know? Ben recovered from the infection, but his Parkinson's remained. Ten months later, on November 22nd, 2010, he had the high-risk DBS surgery performed again. This is with no meds, and he's just finished his first programming session. This time, there were no complications. How does it feel, Dan? Like a miracle. Wow. Couldn't wait for the day that if the DBS worked, 
that I could get up and take care of my little girl. That day came finally, she was, it was like two in the morning, and I heard these little footsteps coming down the hall. I sat up and I walked to the door. Are you, are you okay? And she's like, I can't sleep. I just can't. So I'm like, all right, well, I walked back to her bedroom, lay down with her in bed, closing her eyes, and I was like, yeah, this is gonna work. Can you hold your hands out straight? The disease still is progressing. So this isn't a cure. But he is not frozen in the chair anymore. The disease is manageable again. What I came to understand is life did me a favor when it took away all but my breath. I gone from a nightly crowd of 40,000 to a daily audience of one. No telling what he could have done in the game. At the end of the day, I don't believe it'll be as valuable what he's going to do with his life now. I would hide my symptoms and my disease because I was so ashamed, really. I want to be a strong athlete. It's taken a long time to kind of get over that. Sharing his story, being a voice for the disease. I'll get one for each one of these guys and one for Joe. Cool. That's his calling now. That's his identity. Ben's new lease on life led to the publication of his memoir and to the birth of his second daughter, Madison, in January of 2012. Each day I get a little stronger about being weaker. I think he's so grateful for what he can do. He is so big on never let a moment slip by. I wasn't going to give up because of the fact that I had the disease. So we're going to give up baseball. I'm never going to give up being a father.